Were you a student of John Coltrane's music? Not particularly a student of his music, no. No, later on I had to study it because all the musicians I met during the 60s, 70s, 70s mainly, were into that kind of music. I mean, they were obsessed with it. It seemed to be like a certain kind of a wave of interest, curiosity, and you know, some kind of a, a very special attention was given to his music as a unique sound of the time. So then I came upon it in terms of records and people talking about it, yeah, somewhat. Yeah. But prior to that, as uh, the story goes, I was a drummer. So I think that uh, not having exposure to his particular version or form of interaction with the, the sound and the music of the culture at that point, I was doing my own thing. See? I was being trained to be able to handle that music, but I didn't know that I was being trained in a sense to be able to deal with that level of music, that uh, scope of music, that complexity of music, that depth of music as it was, uh, but I was, I was on the path. See? Didn't have anything to do with Coltrane and such, except that uh, in inevitably what would happen is I had these coincidental experiences of meeting the peeps who worked with him and I heard his name. The name was dropped on me in passing over the years, through the years, you know, when I was, uh, um, say, entering my 20s, the name came up more and more. And when I got into the army band, the name was my more, more, let's say, profoundly spoken about and it was a big deal. But I, I didn't know for sure I was on the course, but I did have dreams about it. And as I have mentioned in other piece, when I was young, I used to listen, when I had the ability to do it, listen to the radio, which is what we had then. And it was jazz radio in the, in the 50s. And I'm sure I heard Coltrane, and I think once when I was in Manhattan, I'm not saying this was Coltrane per se, but I remember hearing music that was intense as I was pass, passing the jazz club. And uh, there seemed to be a connection there. That, that intensity struck me. That crying through the saxophone struck me. I think that was also uh, some kind of uh, a link to Coltrane, because later on, and I did have many dreams of him, especially when I got into the army, him, you know, and uh, I had experiences with him. And so, so I was being set up for that, but I wasn't sure who that, who that exactly was. But I was being set up for that, and inevitably I came upon people who were more closer, you know, more and more dedicated to that, and then. Uh, Cal Calvin Hill uh, and I were playing once in New York City and he said you have to come down to meet Pharaoh and Pharaoh I've heard of, I wasn't familiar with his music that much and then you know that began a more intimate relationship with the Coltrane experience uh, from the viewpoint of Pharaoh's linkage to Coltrane and you know that linked me up with a whole bunch of other players related to the same, the same process, same level and so on. Inevitably running into Rashid uh, Ali, a uh, fellow drummer, and then Robbie Coltrane, which both men spoke to me about and felt that we should get together because it seemed that we were similar, spiritually similar, although musically in different cultures, but spiritually similar, the same kind of a focus on intensity, pure and deep expression, pure expression for real. So, come. Did you recognize a spiritual component to Coltrane's music at that time? How could you not? To, yeah, there was a spiritual com component. It was more of a psychic component. But I think there was somewhat of a spiritual in terms of how I, I, I understand the word and how I use the word in my work, in my life. So spiritual to me means uh, non-cultural. <clears throat> you have a more conventional use of, of the word spiritual and then you say, well, it's moving music, but that's not necessarily spiritual music, but it's, say, it's moving your emotions, but it's not moving your spirit out of the body. See, so how pure African music is about moving the spirit out of your body, forget about emotions. You go into a deeper state of consciousness, maybe even unconsciousness, that to me is more spiritual in a sense. Right? So spiritual has different connotations, different schools, different, different times, with different types of music. They have different ideas of what the spiritual is. Comforting the spiritual, low, low intensity spiritual. Then you have, uh, you know, new age music is considered spiritual music. And that would mean it's not material. If it's not material, it would mean that it's not non-egoic in a sense. But uh, when we're talking spiritual, we're meaning it's minus all those things. See, it is without these kinds of forms of materialism. 
that would be my understanding of what's material, it's transcendent. See? And so, uh, yeah, I, I could hear him going in that direction, so I'd say he's definitely going in that direction, and then uh, listening to him speak and hearing about things that he said, uh, reading some of his words in print, yeah, he was going in that direction for real, so there was a parallel connection with him, for sure. So, as a psychic musician, do you think that his music communicated to you outside of music itself? Well, his music communicated to me the way music communicates to me, you know? I don't listen to the music, I listen to the being. And I try to hear what the music is uh, a medium for. So the music in itself is not the message to me. It's the medium, you know, the medium is, uh, let's say, the person, the human, the channel using music to express something either of themselves through music that is beyond music already and then or something from spirit which is beyond that. See, so in that case, yeah, I heard a little bit of a lot of things in Caltrans music but nothing, nothing that I didn't recognize, uh, nothing that I felt was, uh, uh, let's say, uh, particularly futuristic or anything. No, I, I felt that he was, he was a drummer. I felt that he was a drummer who knew his time, right, his time in, in destiny and history and uh, was in touch with the, the urgency of spiritual liberation in his own way. So, of course, that's all I'm about. That's what happened to me as a child, is get liberated from the music, see, through drums in this case. Drum liberation as a child is what helped me to be uh, able to understand and do the things that I do today. And so do you think that Coltrane um, as a drummer and you as a drummer had parallels? I know he didn't play specifically, but... Oh, obviously. Yeah, see the thing is, I think it's important to say, I, I didn't have an interest in, in going that way, doing that, it wasn't conscious. All I knew is that there was spiritual intensity, in my case, in my body, in my mind, in my experiences. And so I thought it was just, it would be natural for me to meet people who are either parallel to that, functioning parallel to that, or aspiring towards that, or experiencing that or maybe trying to go, go beyond that, which is what I also had to do, is go beyond all my experience as a spiritualist um, from a spiritualist family. It's a good starting point. Religion is a good starting point. Spiritual practice is a good starting point. But we have to go beyond that. We can't, we can't really rest on anything except uh, you know, the pure spirit, which is empty, void of materialism at every level. So yes, there was a connection there. It's not about John Coltrane, except that he definitely is a person who demonstrated to everybody that his mission was to go beyond the barrier set before. That's really the quest of the warrior, basically. That's everybody's spiritual quest. We have, we have to do that in our case, no matter who goes before us. It's upon the individual to do that. When you have somebody map it out for, let's say, the jazz culture, I think that's a fantastic uh, gift for, for the jazz culture, to see, see the, uh, the work of someone like that left before you for the sake of others to follow. But I don't see too many people following that path. See, I don't know that they knew it was a path to follow. See, because it's not about the music, then it's about the message, which is to transcend itself. I heard that immediately in Coltrane's music, that the self was not enough. That who he was in terms of his past and his culture was what he's trying to get beyond. That means extend it, not destroy it, but get beyond it, to outgrow it. See, to, you know, to be more than that. And so so the, the impulse of the creative is really to be more and more and more and more expand to the universe, into the universe, see? participate, partake in the greatness, the hugeness, or the infiniteness of the universe. So anything that's going in that direction, I say it more, more properly, spiritual, because it goes beyond the human mind, it goes beyond the human element completely. His music seemed to resonate with or awaken a lot of spiritual seekers. Um, your, your music does not have the quality of a spiritual seeker. Could you comment on the differences there? Well, I think it, it really has to do with, like, there's no place to go, see? There are no doors and barriers to break down because there are none. See? I didn't feel, as I was growing up, that there were musical barriers. Of course, as a human being, you have to develop, you have to deal with things and then hopefully outgrow them, not just learn how to use them, but outgrow them, continue to expand. So as a drum prodigy, as I would call it, see, someone who, who was born awakened about the drums, as my language, just as other kids awakened to other things, the drums were really that important to me, and that had everything to do with my father who was a drummer. So this is a con continuity here, some kind of a continuum I was maintaining up to a point till, 
till I realized that, okay, that was useful, and then it wasn't useful beyond that point. And so, uh, any other comments on that? Um, just to ask if, um, if you feel the, the qualities, the emotional qualities of Coltrane's music, uh, what they are. Is it, it, there's an element of suffering in there, I'd say, more than there's joy. It's, it seems to be a, a certain pain in his music. I think we, we would say that, well, the pain is, is a pain of life, the pain of human nature. Human errors, human mistakes, human frailties, obviously the pain we're all talking about. It's a, the food, food of the blues. Yeah. It's not about race, although some races uh, at various times in their, their timeline experience you know, horrific trials and tribulations and tests. So every, every experience is a test, a test of your spiritual integrity, your dignity, your basic uh, nobility and such. So, uh, yeah, races go through these changes, but they're not, they're not against the race, they're to season the race, to challenge the race to be stronger. In every case, in all, all the colors, all the different races, they're colors. So, uh, we all, as humans, spirits, have relatively the same commas to go through. We have the same dynamics to go through, relative to the physical, relative to the astral dimension, relative to the causal dimension of memory, relative to the mental dimension of thoughts, past, present, and future lower thoughts, concrete thoughts, conventional thoughts, and then abstract thoughts, and then creative thoughts, maybe even spiritual thoughts beyond that. So we all have to move through the same dimensions regardless of what our culture is, what our field is in it. That's basically where I'm coming from. That's what the early drumming experience liberated me to realize, that we're basically energy beings, because when, when I was playing as a child, things would happen, like the Kundalini would open up, and I'd leave the body and I'd be going up and down. That wasn't common. But when I talk to my aunts, the, the mediums, they say, oh no, that's common for you, you're, you're a shamanic type. I said, oh, I'm a type now. Yeah. Yeah. So having that kind of early life experience put me on par in a manner of speaking with a lot of people who are great artists, but they don't have this extra dimension. So when I meet them, it's not a big deal, because I'm, I'm, I'm part of another dimension, and so I don't have their aspirations, I don't have their seeking, I don't have their... Uh, what is the direction as such? So, as a human being, it's easy for me to evolve, but it's not me evolving, it's my body going through changes as part of its appetite. We have to eat food. See, so it's not like I'm searching for food I need to eat, so it happens. It's not like a mad search for it. But Coltrane's mission was, was a little bit different. It seemed, by virtue of the kind of work he was doing, that uh, scales were very important to him. I've never had a scalar approach. I've had an emotional approach which results in the use of scales because only certain scales and combinations of notes can express those feelings. So pain has been my guru to a certain degree and my life was fraught with a lot of painful experiences. But in my case it always transformed into music. So pain is, to me is music. Not that it's painful, but there's a link with emotion. So my music is a, a form of pure emotional expression that has a cosmic dimension, which means it'll be easy to classify it, for lack of a better word, it's avant-garde jazz. But it's, that's not it, that's not its motivation, that's not where it comes from. It comes from uh, more or less uh, human, human, uh, let's say, suffering, as inherited from my river of blood, ancestry, and then as my body, which is living that, uh, in its own way, it manifested to me many times in many different ways. That the body is, is a vehicle of suffering. And it's up to us to use that, to go beyond that, recognize it properly so that we can use it in terms of artistic and or scientific or it's just basic human expression. Yeah. So we're talking about self-realization as primary. Uh, and then, you know, society and coincidences and the time path as such, your time pattern unfolds and then your, the relations you're, you're keyed, keyed into uh, as a birth time that are set up around that birth time, you see those relations and it's part of your, part of your, your practice, part of your society as such. But that's because the birth, birth indicates that. The birth indicates certain dimensions of that, then your spiritual level of understanding or your human evolutionary, let's say, quotient uh, or uh, say stage of development that determines other relations. And at one point, one thing cuts off, doesn't cease to serve the purpose anymore, you move to another level. So I'd say the, the important thing is to continue to expand, continue to go deeper, and have a, a more of a sense of the infinite as a basis for who you are and what you need to do. It's infinite. It makes it much easier. It's already more neutral. 
say, well, what's, what's ahead? Infinity. What's behind you? Infinity. What's around you? Infinity. And Gold Frame went to an extreme level, which meant that uh, what he did was he lifted the bar, from what I've heard, lifted the bar for peace. That there's no limit, except self. Self-limitation is the limit. Right. Another topic, please. Um, well, let's move on to uh, Pharaoh Sanders, and there's a, a tie there. Um, obviously, he had a similar uh, karma, so it seems, to John Coltrane in a similar path, but the expression is different. There seems to be a more ecstatic quality to what he produced. Uh, could you comment on the differences and similarities? Pharaoh, in a way, is humorous. Uh, we, can, we can hear in Coltrane's music a basic goodness, a very, very heartful person, no question about it. And he had pain, he had a lot of pain in his body. And when I would listen to his records when I was young, I felt the pain. I said, well, where's this pain coming from? I felt fine before I listened to this record. And it was coming from his pain, because I found out later on, he was in pain, and he sounded like it. See, so that's a lesson for peeps. You're going to listen to music, you're going to be taking on the karma of the peeps you're listening to. You may not be that sensitive as I was, or I am. So, you know, you can listen to more music than I can, because of my sensitivity, and my kind of absorption, my kind of, you know, let's say, receptivity to what it is. And so with Pharaoh, who I knew personally, directly, and spent a lot of time with, Oh, he's a humorous person. He's humorous. And quite capable. You know, he's, he's, more, he's, he's more capable than people think because he, he loves simple things. And that would lead you to believe it's just that. No, he's not, not quite that. He's not exactly a jazz musician. He's more what I would consider to be a more advanced folk musician. He's a person that plays for peeps and he's a folk player. But then he also plays for himself. So he has, he, he has, he has that um, search, going, search mode going on in him too where he's looking for more things to play, better things to play, because it may not, it may not come to him as, as naturally or easily as it may come to me through emotion. So I, I have emotion, and through experiencing emotion, I hear things differently, because the emotions that come up, come up in different contexts. I mean, new melodies. That's how it works for me. I can't say it's supposed to work that way for other people. That's my advantage. And so with Pharaoh, I would hear him playing things when we do concerts, off the stage, off the bandstand, they're absolutely beautiful, wonderful things. And I said, Phil, why don't you play that? I said, well, I'm playing that for now. And that's a, in other words, that's, that's what the moment warranted for him. And it's true in my case too, when I'm alone and doing things, and beautiful things will come up. The beauty's there. You feel the beauty. But then when you're in the context of peeps, then you've got to relate to that as reality. And there may be some beauty, but there may be other things. So you have to be ready to play. Whatever the need is, depending on what, what level you're channeling what. Because Pharaoh is a psychic musician. I'm similar. Coltrane was obviously a certain type of psychic musician, played from his feelings, his intuition, and uh, you know, sensitive person. So it depends on the vibes of the space the situation. Where I work not so much from the compositions, you know, like with a, a, a normal conventional program. So I'm going to play these tunes. But if I go into a place and I feel strange or I feel something I need to deal with, then I change the program and go with that. So there's a psychic basis for it. And then what happens when I go by that basis, I feel a hundred times better after having played that than had I played the other thing and not reached the same level, the same intensity, or the same problems in the atmosphere. You've got to deal with the problems in the atmosphere. First, in this case, you've got to heal yourself, make sure you're feeling good, then what you're giving to people is part of that goodness. And then when you share your goodness with the people, then you can take them out of that to the next level, which is out of this world, the next dimension. That doesn't mean it's going to fit into a classical sort of set of dynamics and or parameters. Because classical music is not given for the psychic kind of advantage or the psychic dimension, see, the glorious dimension of purification and healing. Okay. Working from the inside out with the classical dimension, for the most part, more intellectual version of what's right, what's good, what's useful for the peeps, or what's familiar, what, what is diggable, you know, likable, you know, or their idea of what is beautiful. So it's not a matter of what is, what is obviously beautiful in terms of a certain kind of diatonic scale, see, uh, a fundamental scale like that, and harmonies, fundamental harmonies, that's not necessarily beautiful. They have their time and place, see. And so this is the key to healing, is knowing when uh, a minor chord brings the healing and the beauty because of its trueness in that moment, rather than something that's composed and 
you know, out of the context of the moment, and then it's just imposed on them because of its marvelous virtuosity and te technique, right, and mastery of harmony and all its tricks and all of its bells and whistles. Well, this is greatness. Uh, I don't think so. It's great in its own way, because it's not, it's not easy to do. So the architecture of, of classical music is impressive, but it's not true. It's just impressive. It works. It's useful. It serves some peeps, but not everybody. It could be too much for peeps. Or too little for peeps, spiritually. Too little. It's a bunch of sound, a bunch of banging, a bunch of blowing. And, and maybe perfect for its cultural setting, but not not for other peeps. And so this is see, the mystery of music. See? And there you have, you have countries that have this very specific music that deals with the tonality and the vibrations of the culture. And that's perfect. And so my culture, which more mix the Latin American culture, originally from birth, is very mixed, very complex, very multi-racial, multi-national, sort of uh, ethnic mess of sorts. It's a little bit of everything. Classical music, show music, rhythmic music, African music, uh, med uh, Mediterranean music, it's got all kinds of things in it. So it works. It means, you know, then, then you have to find something else to get your, your beauty and your healing from. But when we look at it carefully, we see that it's a dance music. And so the healing comes by way of dance. So it's a dance form that gets you up and dancing. That's its main purpose, to swing, but to dance and feel liberated. So you get away from your suffering and your problems. That's not necessarily the same design behind the, uh, let's say, classical school, particularly the older schools, but maybe you know, new schools of music may have a different approach to what the healing element is in classical music. Although, from this viewpoint, at the same time, one note played at the right time can heal all things. So, for mus musicians who, by agreement and obligation are playing conventional music. Um, how do they put these insights into use, the recognition of the psychic components of the audience or the uh, venue? Uh, well, we can, say, we can say good luck, because it's not about insight. You have, to know how, you, you have to know what to do with your time and your karma. So you can't just take an insight. I mean, you can, but it doesn't mean an insight is going to work in your situation. See? It depends on where that insight's coming from. That insight, in this case, is coming from a way of life, not just a small insight recommendation about something. You're having an insight into this way of life, not into your way of life. So you, be, you have to be able to make the distinction between who's talking about their culture or their, their, let's say, process, and how that's supposed to work in somebody else's process. Now, it could, but it's not given for other people. It's given to reveal the nature of itself. Say, so, no, this is how I do it, and why I do it, because of the way my life has unfolded, and the way uh, my progression has been. See, as a sound being, not as a musical being, but as a sound being, and without sound you don't have music, so that's more primordial, sound. See, drum sound, yeah, but then it was chanting sound, so it wasn't just drums, it was drums to release the voice, and that was part of it. Native, let's say, um, expansion of intelligence from, from the bodies, vibrations, lifting those vibrations up, raising the vib rate of vibration up to the voice, and then liberating the voice, liberating the flesh, liberating the voice, liberating the mind, right, the heart, the feelings, by, by chanting and shouting or, you know, releasing it vocally, and then to other levels, higher levels, moving into a higher consciousness. Okay? Not getting stoned, just using basic laws of physics and acoustics and rhythm, time and space, and feeling, harmony, right, voice, and others, to create this, not cacophony for others, outside of the field is cacophony, but beautiful um, harmony, yeah. mm -hmm. harmony, feeling of, uh, let's say, unity, psychic resonance, unity, movement, see, uh, with all kinds of different rhythmic patterns, but they're in, they're in resonance with each other, you know, improvisationally speaking, not against one another, so it's not cacophony, it's polyphony maybe, see? See? true harmony in a sense. And that's what we need to arrive at in all band situations, which is an insight people can, can use. 
You gotta make sure you're in proper resonance. Not just playing parts abstractly because they're written out on pieces of paper. That doesn't mean you, you're getting any closer to anybody. Let alone your, your fellow musicians sitting right next to you in the next chair. Doesn't mean you're getting any closer to them. Sure, you have a common experience, but then after that, what? There's no common experience after that. There's no connection after that. So you, without the music, you have no connection. And we're talking about, about not musical connection, we're talking about heart connection now. So when you're working through heart connection, that's a very different, different dynamic, a very different dimension to be working from. And so again, these are abstract ideas because they're not in the domain of ordinary human consciousness or conversation. Yeah. Because that's not the focus of most people. Could it be? Of course it could be, but it doesn't mean it will ever be. So then, with your kind of music, uh, how would the element of, of conflict between musicians uh, affect what you accomplish? Uh, in what sense? What musicians? What, I don't have musicians I'm in conflict with. Okay. That's the first thing. Okay. So, as soon as musicians come into me, we start working on the conflict as soon as I start speaking. But they have to be willing to hear what I have to say. If they're not able to grasp what I have to say, then I don't talk to peeps. I don't have anything to say to peeps who feel they know it all, and they have all the answers for themselves. Yeah. Nobody has that. Yeah. That's a game. Because there are no answers for anybody. See, in truth, from the deepest level, there's no mind at all. There's just heart. Deepest level, there's just heart. People, people are afraid of that, so they have to hold themselves back from the deepest level so that they can function at the superficial level of conventional interaction with other peeps. Mm. That's safe. And you can make money that way. So it's wise to do it, say, from that viewpoint. But it's not necessarily healing. It's wise. Yeah. So uh, prior to playing, do you, let's say, seek agreement between the players or at least make sure it exists? I, I don't seek agreement with the players, but I try to... I mean, the people who I play with, basically, are people I know. People who know me, they have a certain feeling for it, so it has to be that way. I'm not a working player in a manner of speaking. I'm not looking, asking people to hire me. I don't have any, any interest in being hired. See, that's not my karma. My karma is that's already given to me. Everything is given to me in a certain way. In fact, it's kind of like uh, an exceptional life in a certain way. Where every, every, without me asking for it, things show up. Yeah. And that's how spirit's give, given it. And that's what I was told that it would, it would happen in, in that manner. And so it has happened in that manner. That if you do a certain work, then it gets out there, see? Because we're not isolated. The illusion or delusion is that we're isolated individuals. There's really no such thing in the, in the name of spirit. You are an individual, but no, you're, you're an individual. You're an apparent individual, but part of a cosmic fabric and, and a network, actually. And that, that, strangely enough, spirit is hearing things. There's an intelligence, I'm calling it spirit. Right? There's a force out here of intelligence, called creative intelligence, that is not limited to the body. See, it's an all-pervasive kind of field. See, it's a field. And we are, we're sort of connected. We're in this ocean of creative intelligence. It's not void. I mean, it's void of self, so we can say it's also void. But it, it is something which is alive. It's space. It's living space. And that's how people come to me out of nowhere and say, oh, they had a dream about me or something, and they show up and they have something I need. And that's because there's a, a knowingness going on for sensitive peeps. A psychic universe that works, it's alive, it's, it's behind the scenes, but it's also obvious to certain peeps. So that's what we're talking about here, the, the way the spirit works, that's what it's called for now. And that means the intelligence uh, operating between certain beings that have no physical connection, no self-connection. So there's, there's been enough put out there that people know to see these a certain kind of spiritual entity or he's into that kind of thing. And that, that really affects people and it puts them in a certain way where they become receptive right away. So a lot of people I meet are not hostile, they're more receptive, and that means we have space between us, we have some heart space between us, and that's the beauty of it, so I meet people. And I said, you know, I'm open to them, I feel it's great to meet the peeps, you know. Doesn't mean we're going to relate to anything, but if we go feel a little bit more inside, see, more intuitively what's going on, and say, no, see, a certain type of person is here to help peeps, i say, yeah, that's basically it. That comes from my family directive to be a healer. See? Born into a healing family. And so, so quietness, gentleness, all these things are part of, part of the basis of this. But I have fierceness in my music, which is you know, part of my cutting through the slime and sludge 
of the present karmic condition of society, I have to carve away through that, and that's what I do in my music, clear away. So when working with you, are uh, your musicians better able to, let's say, be a vehicle for the music to come through them? As opposed they have to, to learn how to do that. But if they spend time with me or read my books or hear my music, it might be easier for them to do that. And what I'm saying is natural, it's not unique to me. How I do it, what I do, is more unique to the individual side of what it is that's happening. But we're talking about a universal process, so it's really, you have to have your mind on the healing approach to it, otherwise you're not going to get it. It doesn't matter what you play, how long you play it, or anything like that. You won't get it. It's got to be heart first. If you're not heart first, it's not going to work. If you're music first, you never get there. Until you make heart first. And music's more important for most people. And so heart is neglected. It's, I mean, it's maybe too esoteric, if you can imagine. It's too esoteric. It's too hard. Heart. Yeah, I play with heart. I play with force. I play with this. I play with that. That's not heart. Heart is more subtle than that. More subtle. Sacred. And it doesn't have a beginning or end, so you really have to be in its space in order, in order to be in proper resonance with it. Then even one note will kill you, see, in the most beautiful way. Heart resonance. So when the music comes from there, then there's no problem with it. I don't care what form it is. There are many players out there, many singers that come from that heart place, and you have to find them yourself. Your ear will tell you, and your feelings will tell you where they are. Yeah. There, there, there are many out there, not doing what I'm doing particularly, but they're doing what they have to do, see, to bring healing to the peeps. See. Um, you're, you're unusual in the sense that you, you put a lot of emphasis on sound, whereas most musicians really limit themselves to music or perhaps to, to tone. So, you know, musicians obsess on their tone. Can you comment on tone versus sound? Well, it's all related. Everything is relevant. You know, you're talking about phenomena, so it's, you, you don't have to call it anything. We call it phenomena. Whatever the phenomena is you want to perceive, and that's reflecting you. It's self-reflexive. No problem with that. Getting your sound together. But that's not the sound I'm talking about. I'm not talking about what your ear hears. Yeah. So, that's it. Different universe. You're talking about the material universe and the spiritual universe. See, the spiritual universe is sound, but you can't hear it. Yet, without it, you wouldn't exist. So then, you may as well just call it silence, but it's a dynamic form of silence. But it's, it's that silence from which everything appears and disappears into. Yeah. So, does musical training give one more access to or understanding of sound in the way you see it? No, no. It takes you away from it because you're thinking more in terms of music. And music in terms of, unfortunately, what's on the paper, which is business. I mean, that's business, playing music uh, in the form of entertaining other beats. So that's business. There's nothing wrong with it, it's just it's business. It's not about going deeper. It's not like you're surrendering anything. Right? You're training yourself to, to egoically uh, develop personality that is part of that culture, the musician's culture. Nothing wrong with it. You've got to go through that. When that's before you, you must, you must meet the challenge. When that disappears from you, then you must meet the challenge. That disappeared from me. Remember, I was in the army band. I mean, it doesn't get any more classical than that. You talk about Julia, then you have the army band. There's no difference there. Both of them kill you, right? You got to be impeccable. You got to learn. You got to you got to play exactly what, what it is. I did that for a while, so I, I have an idea what that is. Stage band, marching band, all kinds of bands, jazz band, see, uh, theater band. Um, Blues band, uh, not quite a rock band, but you know, R&B band, yeah, different kinds of bands. So I had a good experience. It's like a universe of music in, in a very short amount of time. Yeah, but that's my karma. That's exactly how, how it works for me. I'm not saying anybody else should do it that way or expect it to be right for them, particularly. But that's the kind of mess I was born into. I had to sort it out, get through it, understand it, put it to use, put it behind me and keep moving. So, for a young musician immersing themselves in musical training, uh, it would seem that uh, without some kind of spiritual practice, mm -hmm. they would uh, they would be losing as much as they would be gaining. It's it possible. The idea of spiritual practice is get in touch with your being as non-being. See, that means your egoless being. That means your real being, the egoless. 
Say, when the ego comes in, it means how you have to show up. Say, what you need to defend and protect and, and so on, carry on, say, in a particular sense. Say, something, that thing which you need to communicate to other peeps to qualify you for being in their company and so on and so forth. And then that thing, once you're, you're there, you don't have to use that thing anymore. It's the mask of self, the self mask. Then you're more or less then free to be selfless in any environment, even, even music. You can play music selflessly. Our selflessness, selflessness is not unnatural. It is the basis already. We are selfless beings by nature. And, but then we are self beings because that's also the nature of the common and time where we're in. Where you got to use self. You got to be selfish. Yeah. Not everybody has to be selfish, but some people have to be selfish as part of their training. That you have to, you have to understand what it is. It's a mask you have to wear to get a job done. Then you have to take that mask off. Otherwise, you're not going to live properly. If you just live with that mask on, it's like carrying a, a huge mask on your face all the time. It's going to wear, wear you out, carry you down. It's going to kill you or make you sick, because it's unnatural. It's unnatural to be an egomaniac for a lot of peeps. For some peeps, that's what they get paid to do, so they have to do that. But then they have to take that mask off. And they have to come off of that and be a real person, otherwise they're not going to have any family, not going to have any friends. And so you have to know how to use the, the uh, appearance, uh, the glamour, uh, which we might say is uh, ego, see, the mask of ego, self-importance. You have to know how to use that. The idea is to be as dignified as possible, use your mask properly, but then be all hard. Don't forget the heart. Don't, don't, don't uh, let's say, um, deny your, your right to heart nature. So it would seem that sound would uh, more easily equate with selflessness or egolessness. Where sound is nothing you can hear, so it's a mystery. So you got to put that in your hat right away or in your pipe and smoke it. If you're carrying a pipe, you want to you use your pipe. <laughs> <laughs> and, and put it in there and smoke it. That's it. Yeah. It's a mystery. Yeah. Yeah. It's just like silence. I mean, you, a, lot, a lot of people here programmed to think that well, silence is the absence of sound. No, silence is the presence of sound. Mm -hmm. It's the profound presence of sound. And many people have the intuitive understanding to say, wow, when they he heard my concert, all they heard was silence. I said, perfect, good for you. They, they weren't deceived by the, by the appearance of the music. They weren't deceived by that. In other words, they didn't hear what, what it was being produced. They heard where it was coming from. They didn't hear the effect. They heard the cause. They heard the source. They didn't hear the results. So, so the music was like a, a bridge to. They said, well, it showed up as music, but what I felt was something other than what I ever felt before. And I said, good, you, you got what it was, which is not what it is. It's not what it appears as. So, can that occur with, let's say, a spiritual musician playing conventional music? Can their heart come through even if the music doesn't contain? Well, I'm not sure what that means exactly. Can your heart come through even though? It depends on where, where you're at. So it's not about you being a conventional musician or anything. You have, to, you have to surrender yourself to the way of the heart, and then that's all there is. When that's all there is, moment by moment, that might be all that comes through, but until that's all there is, it's a nice theory. Good luck. So, in the meantime, until that comes through, what, what, how do musicians develop and deepen their expression? That depends on what, what their search is. Depends on what they're searching for. Now, what is it saying? Well, this is something else to do? You won't get there that way. Is this something else to learn? You won't get there that way. That's something you can put in your pocket. Yeah. That's something you can put a, hide away in your drawer and you know, take some up here and there. No, it's talking about big quantity and beyond quantity, in fact. We're talking about the source, which is a paradox. It is, but it isn't. It's present, yet it's absent. So to the degree that it is absent, then you might get closer to what it is as a presence. So, um the, the heartfelt nature of the player um, only goes so far, it would seem, and then beyond it, is it, is it a matter of deepening or training or...? Well, the, it, anybody can have a hard feeling. That's not what it is. Yeah. Because you're talking about a moment, it's like a glimpse of something. Well, I mean, it's valid as a glimpse. But we're talking about the reality that that is, in order for you to have the realization that that's all there is. And do you find that some of the musicians you play with get that from the experience of playing with you? 
they have uh, more to say about it, and they feel it. They call it the healing quality in the music. And so it's, it's subjective, no doubt, but it's, it's also objective. It's real for, for those people who can feel it. Not everybody's designed to feel it. Not everybody is designed to resonate with it, so not everybody can be in agreement with what I'm saying. Because it's not their experience, it's not, it's not true. It is true, but you have to get to that level in order for it to be true for you. We have to have common ground. We have to come to the same place at the same time. And some people feel it through the music, some people can't comprehend the music whatsoever. And they swear they're heart beings, but they can't comprehend the music. That's because at the astral level, at the emotional level, they don't have access to it. They're not musicians. They're not musical in the same way. So you mentioned feeling the pain in John Coltrane's music, but conversely, would other people feel healing from that same music due to their condition? Oh, no, no doubt. They're going, to hear, they're going to feel the freedom in that music, so they're going to feel pleasure first. They're not going to be that sensitive to hear the pain necessarily. Or feel it. You can hear it in his, in his, uh, you know, emotions, and in his uh, sort of cryings, you know, in his uh, longings. You hear, the, you hear his notes. You hear his playing. You hear his emotion. You hear his feeling. Yeah. His feeling of wanting, wanting liberation from, you know, being himself, being stuck, in, in needing to know. You hear all of that in there. But then you hear compassion. Yeah. Compassion. Plain old simple compassion for other peeps, feeling their suffering, and, and wishing to be able to do something about it. You hear all of that in my music. You hear both ends of it. So, what is, uh, can you talk about... But I'm not saying everybody hears that. Yeah. Right? A lot of peeps hear cacophony in his music. They hear craziness. Uh, I don't hear any of that. I don't think he felt he, that he had any of that. But uh, the music arranged the way it is relative to his kind of mind well, would, would be considered kind of cacophonic. I mean, it's a little bit complicated for other people to comprehend because their minds are more fundamentally simple and their musical needs are more simple. So it's really about uh, what you need coming. Uh, I just wanted to ask, um, for some people, the, the most powerful music is music that expresses the, the tragic, the heartbreak, the catastrophic, and that seems to have, paradoxically, a healing effect for them. Uh, yeah, kind of like Shakespearean plays do for many people. Yeah. So yeah, uh, tragic genius is very important to all of us. Mm -hmm. Without tragedy, I, I wouldn't be here. And without many tragedies, I wouldn't be here. I come, come from uh, quite a series of different kinds of tragedies. Physical tragedies, you know, blood loss and all this, uh, which I feel is not, you know, a, a bragging point, what it is, is no, it's a purification point. So you have to know suffering. To be a good artist, to be a person of the heart, you have to come close to death, you have to die, basically. You have to know what death is. You have to be that close to it, where you have one, one last breath, but then you, you come back. Yeah. And so that's the, be the beauty of it, see. That, that, that reaches the peeps, that shocks the peeps. See. So tragedy, it's a good wake-up call, it's a good bell ringing. To, to uh, more or less uh, communicate the, the, the um, very powerful message that you're mortal and you're going to die. And the only way you're going to become an immortal is to be able to die into immortality. Right. So when your music uh, embodies the tragic, is it as a result of the psychic field in the venue you're playing or is it from your desire to express that? Well, it's not a desire. Big mistake. In, 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 language in that sense. It's a need, not a desire. So as soon as I walk from one room to another, I might feel the need to go tragic because that's the only way I'm going to wake certain people up and heal them. And, and that is to identify with their, their suffering. So the tragedy then is a, is a mode of communication, yeah. a mode of awakening, awakenment by a tragic experience, yeah. trauma, yeah. severe suffering, acute pain, Part of it, and then you wake up. You you wake out of the dream of suffering into the realization of happiness. But that's because someone someone was able to recognize you. You you're being in that dream. And so you got to be awakened from the dream of tragedy by someone who's conscious beyond tragedy. Yeah. Very simple. But we're talking about a different level of intelligence.
Yeah, just as a comment, I would say, having heard you perform a number of times, that when you uh, put out that kind of music with that tragic quality, it, it, it's never in a, a stuck sense or boxed in. It's sense. always passing through. It's always yeah. a step. Always a step. A profound step. Say, now we shall be here, ladies and gentlemen. We shall know the heartbreak of humanity for a moment. And the next, we shall know the, the joy of liberation. And we shall know the music of the heavens at the same time. See? Not as they were for one classical musician or even a hundred classical musicians, but as they are for this moment. See? The music of the heavens as they are now. Is, is what you do um, uh, possible to achieve through composition and more structured, conventional types of music? No, I don't see it. No, what, what, as I mentioned, what I do is from the inside out, not from the outside in. You can get results from the outside in, but when it comes from the inside out, it's a whole different uh, species. See? It, it is its own reality from the outside. You're borrowing from the outside, but you're being from the inside. Very important distinction to make for you. And everybody else who hears this. Borrow from the outside or be from the inside. Come in. So for, you know, music students who might be hearing this, uh, you know, in a developing musical skills, um, what else do you recommend for them to develop as beings who can... Exhaust their need to know. Exhaust your need to know, because you won't stop knowing until you exhaust it. When you get to the point that there's nothing else to know that is possible for you to know, then you can start playing music from, from a different viewpoint. This is beyond knowing. This is knowing beyond knowing and playing beyond playing. And I'm not playing on words here, it's a fact of the matter, because there are very, very many dimensions of consciousness. And genius is deeper than genius is deeper. Beyond that. Spirit is the source of all genius. Genius is related to spirit in some way. That means a spook, a spook, like the who knows element. Don't know where it comes from. That's genius. Playing what you know is not genius, it's just playing what you know. Now, someone said, well, he has a genius for playing what you know. It's playing with words there. Genius is not knowing. Genius is transcendent. From my viewpoint, genius is something else. It's old, old school genius whispers to you comes upon you, it overwhelms you, that's genius, overwhelms you, and you, you're help, helpless, yeah. and that's what I know, yeah. you can't escape it, and if you don't do it, you're in trouble, I mean, that sounds violent, sounds mad, but it is madness, yeah. to face it, it's all of that, it's not, not, not nice, it's not kind, yeah. it's not sweet, it's force, yeah. fierce force, it's an encounter with like a, Certain kind of a spirit, and it's still within. It's a spirit within, which stays dormant, maybe even suppressed or oppressed by culture, conditioning, by delusion. You want it to be a nice guy. You want to be a good person. That's not confronting your potential genius. You can educate yourself, have a lot of knowledge, and be very impressive, even at a genius level, perhaps. It's not genius. You're wound up. That's not what this is. This is spontaneous. You can't wind this up. It's already sprung. <laughs> it's already done, in a sense. So you have to catch it. Or it catches you. I think it's more it catches you. You have to be caught by it. Otherwise, you're catching it, and what you catch is less than you. What catches you is more than you. You want to get, consider those, those thoughts as part of the insight into the nature of what I'm talking about. So, uh, the conventional music of today created in the past... Uh, or created today, out of the past. Same thing. Created today, out of the past. A lot of music that people write is, is from music existing, existing music. They find devices, they find things that work, they put it together. They patch, they're patchworks, in some cases. Sometimes it's original, because we know, each one of us has a potential of originality. When we forget, you know, when we stop thinking, when we forget about ourselves, maybe it can come through. And so the, the creators or innovators of the past, let's say, uh, Telemann and Bach, uh, were, were they 
you know, they're, they're conventional now from our viewpoint, but were they cutting edge? Were they at the limits? With uh, you'd, you'd have to go back to the context of their time, their timeline, and see how much of what they're doing sounds familiar. When you have something that's remarkably unfamiliar with its time, then you may have something that, that's what we're talking about. In other words, the person is in their own time. And that time is not part of everybody else's time. And that's obvious. So they're out of time, because they're in their own time. Nobody wants to hear their stuff, particularly, because they're out of time. They're not in time. They're not in step with everybody else. They have a totally, completely different value system. That's a little bit more along the lines of when, when spirit pays you a visit. It can be that way. But it could also be the other way. It could be, so, well, the spirit might need you to play totally Im immaculately beautiful music. Yeah. Could be it, too. But then you may not have, have anything to do with it. You may not want to have anything to do with it yourself. I don't want to have to play this music. Right? Because of your feelings and your nature and your character, you would say, no, this music's not mine. I got this from an angel, I got this from a, a bug or something. Yeah. We could say then, I mean, hypothetically, that could be grounds for saying whether well, a person's inspired. Yeah. So then, In other words, something was, was whispered into the ear, into the mind, it's given to them. And so I think that that happens often in open heart, so it's not something that's a problem. No, it's not. Art is not bereft of that phenomenon. That, that coincides with the phenomenon in art as it also occurs in science. Yeah. Yeah. So, any other questions? No. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Thank you.